Good afternoon. I'm David Curry, and I'm, I'm going to be very brief because my voice is gradually giving out. I keep giving out. Uh, but I'm uh, privileged to welcome all of you here and to welcome our panel. This is an event we've been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, this, this book, I think, is a miracle, uh, and it represents uh, what so many of you can become, and that is movers and shakers and people who, uh, as Steve Jobs used to say, put a dent in the universe, uh, which I think is important. Uh, a way of understanding things in your generation. Uh, these, the authors of this book, uh, or the, uh, the, people, the three folks you see up here with Bill George, are all, two of them graduated to a joint degree, the business school and county school. Uh, and the third is currently a joint degree student in the county school and the business school. Uh, and the, this project, I think uh, John Coleman, were you really the ringleader as I assume you were? Yeah, I think you were. Uh, <coughs> uh, John Coleman and, and David Laybar are both uh, favorite students of mine who were here. Uh, both worked with me in my class, class assistants, both were stars uh, here. I, I know Jake was well. Um, but they represent and have thought a lot about what the opportunities are, what the responsibilities are of your generation, uh, especially those of you who are uh, going to be working as you will. You may start out in the business sector, but come over across into the nonprofit, or you work in, in, the, in the governmental sector. <clears throat> but along the way, you're going to, whether, whatever sector you're in, you're also going to be working in partnership with and alliance with people in these other sectors. And I thought it was an inspired idea for students who were joint degree students to. Uh, uh, to think about and pull together essays uh, from other students about the prospects for this generation. Because a lot of us are really curious. I, mean, I can't tell you how much this country has invested uh, in terms of our future hopes uh, in, in the, your generation. Uh, uh, Bill George and I are of an age when both of us have gotten a little skeptical about our generation and a little, and a little uh, more than anxious, I would say about the leadership uh, from both the public and the, and the, and the for-profit sectors. But we, both of us have felt strongly in what has drawn us to this camp campus uh, is, the, is the idea that your generation represents the hope of the future. And so the, to bring together some of these ideas in a book and in the conversation in this way is, I think, an enormous contribution. And I congratulate you and your other, uh, the, the other co-editors. Let me say a word about uh, and to say directly to my, to my left, Bill George. I, I cannot tell you what an inspiration he has been uh, for so many students who are pursuing these kinds of ideas. He, after having an extraordinarily successful career of his own in the private sector, uh, he came here to this, after teaching a couple of other places, Harvard persuaded him to come here, and he started the course with the business school and leadership that is now is wildly popular there, has really influenced the uh, curriculum uh, and the uh, new dean at Noria uh, has, has seized upon a lot of Bill's work and has made bringing transformations uh, to the business school that I think are entirely laudable and are coming so swiftly. I can't believe it's actually yeah. happening in the university um, as, as quickly as it has. But Bill's influence has, of course, extended well into the Kennedy School as well. Uh, through his uh, fellowship program that he set up for uh, joint degree students with business and, uh, and Kennedy, uh, through his work with students here. And he's an enormous good mentor with so many uh, students. I, I just can't, I, I, the, the honor roll list of people he's mentored is one of the people who have gone to do really interesting things. And he's also been working with young global leaders in Tavos. He just came back to Tavos at the end of this last week. But he has been a driving force in trying to shape that program. And so uh, we're going to ask, ask Bill has kindly agreed to come in for this today and ask him to lead the conversation. Uh, but, I, but I want to thank you, Bill, for the, your generosity, for your help, your support here uh, at the Kennedy School. And I want to salute those of you who are involved in this book. I think you've done a really marvelous job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And uh, it's because of you, I think, that all of us are here. And we appreciate all that you're doing and have done. And uh, you're also a leadership in the nation through uh, your frequent appearances nationally on CNN. And uh, the thoughtful voice you bring to what has got to be 
a crazy world out there. I'm sure glad I'm not talking about politics. That's why I lost my voice. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to handle this. I mean, you're going to have some cooper tonight, so you're going to have to come up with a new voice. <laughs> Maybe a little salt water. Uh, I just got back from Davos, and before I introduce our panelists, plunge into the questions. I thought I'd just share a couple of thoughts with you as precedent preference to uh, what we're doing. Uh, Davos World Economic Forum, about 3,000 people come every year, ministers, uh, heads of state, many, many heads of state, and you know, Geithner was there, and Angela Merkel, Merkel gave the opening keynote, and, and they're all there. But Davos is, is starting to operate on two different levels. There's the level of the political leaders, and that's what you read in the media. But there's a very different level operated, and that's the heads of the organizational level, the CEOs, the nonprofit leaders, who are operating in much smaller groups, uh, more like this size, uh, you know, up to 100 or 200, but not in the massive auditoriums. And uh, there's a very, I don't hear much change in the political leaders. They're addressing current problems, very much short-term focus. But I want to share with you, there is a major change and maybe it's because I want to see it happen that uh, I'm picking up on it. But I believe it's a massive change going on in the thinking of leaders outside of the political arena right now. And I encourage you to really think about that hard. It's very hard to find it in the media, certainly not in the, uh, the mainstream day-to-day -day media, but it is there to sure I can, uh, can share. I had direct contact uh, with about five of dozen CEOs and the thinking of CEOs of corporations, saw Wendy Kopp there, Teach for America, uh, is really changing. And I think a, there's a realization post 2008, the meltdown, uh, that those who chase the, uh, the Friedman ideal of maximizing short term shareholder value are on a fool's folly and that they can only wind up in a cul de sac that there is no out for their corporations, and that has led to the destruction of so many great corporations. You probably know that Kodak filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> and General Motors, of course, is now doing very well. Now it's come out of bankruptcy, but it had to get to 50 years to get there. And uh, I think they're realizing that, uh, yes, you have to perform in the near term, but to play that game is the destruction of great enterprises. We've seen that happen in great enterprises like Hewlett Packard. And so the leaders now are really thinking very differently. I'll give you one example. I was at a, a, uh, I ran a four hour seminar, four hours, that's very unusual. Most people in Davos have all their time carved up into three minute meetings and 20 minute meetings. And for the C CEOs of the 41 largest consumer companies, everyone except Procter Gamble was there. Mukhtar Kent from Coca-Cola, and Paul Bowman from Unilever, and I'm not dropping names, I'm just saying they were all there. And they were focusing on how their industry is going to take on major issues. One of them is the water shortage coming in the world. And Mr. Kent was passionate. He spoke repeatedly about this. He's leading a task force to do this. And Paul Pullman about sustainable consumption. And Ken Powell, CEO of General Mills, talking about wellness. And all of these people are really very dedicated to coming together. And Pullman made a very clear point. We're going to compete at the market. We have to be sure we're not competing over these major initiatives that matter so much to the globe. These people are all very very globally oriented because they all run major global enterprise. Companies like Unilever may surprise you that has 52% of its businesses in Asia, rapidly going to seven. So there's a big change in thinking uh, right now. I can't say this is necessarily true for the Wall Street CEOs. As the consumer guy said, we're on our toes and they're on their heels. But I can say that among corporate leaders around the world, there's a massive change in thinking in India and in China, and uh, maybe a little less so in China, but I think it's, it, it's really much, very much focusing in a new way. And I think what this is doing is paving a way for your generation of leaders to take over, because you know, these leaders are recognizing that they've got to move away from hierarchy, get to collaboration, move away uh, and move to much more of uh, organizational model look much more like the internet than they do the classic military hierarchy of the, uh, that came out of the, the two world wars in the 20th century. And that, that that model will not work today and it will not inflame the leaders of your generation. And I think what this is doing is opening up massive opportunities for the uh, Gen Xers and millennial generations to step up and take charge. And 
I've been advocating that it's about time that happened, and uh, it will be a very good thing for the people in my generation. David Rubenstein, when I said this to the young global leaders, <laughs> and I'm mocking me, David's the head of Carlisle Group, uh, and a funder of the school, got up and walked off the stage as kind of a, a joke when I said it's time for this, but, but I meant it. I think it is time to go through the massive generation of change. These things don't happen overnight, but it's clearly happening, and it's happening faster than even I expected. Now, you see it in the entrepreneurs, the Facebook IPO coming out today, being announced, and Zuckerberg uh, being so successful. Hopefully that will inflame a lot of other people to take the risk and plunge in and found things. But I think that the real difference between the Gen X and millennial generation is this incredible sense of passion for a purpose and having a raison d'etre for, for your work. And that's what I see in the young global leaders. There's now a group that uh, they've created called the Global Shapers. And there's uh, some 1,200 Global Shapers that have just been formed in the last eight months. There are people in their 20s that have really make a difference. And so without taking more time away from our panel, I just want to use that as kind of setting up because I think John's book uh, that he's written with uh, Olivier, Oliver, and, and Daniel really is, is really documenting this in very specific terms about what can be done and why wait. I always say to you, why would you wait uh, and, and while your wife away toiling in the trenches when you have a chance to go out and lead and make a difference. And so I hope that much of our panel will focus today on how young leaders, and I'm for young as anyone under 40, can really make a difference right now. And uh, we saw it when he got the Dell and Teach for America, founded at 22 years old with no resources, no money, and zero leadership experience. And it's just stunning the impact she's having on the whole uh, U.S. education community. These kinds of things are happening in every sector, except perhaps the political sector. I, I won't comment on that, because I just don't have enough expertise and knowledge. But having studied the others, uh, I see this happening, and I think, John, your book really captures it extremely well what can be done in some depth. And so I think we need examples and we need role models. We need role models leaders in my generation, David's generation, but we also need role models in your generation. People say, hey, that can be done. Not everyone's going to be a Mark Zuckerberg or a Larry Page, uh, you know, but I think all of us can focus our energies and efforts on making a difference. And I think that's what you're really showing that you don't have to wait and you can uh, you can take the initiative now, and that's why the stories from passion and purpose are so important to give people and to take that out to the world and give such a much broader, uh, uh, broader view of that. So we have three outstanding panelists today. I'm, I'm proud to say they're all uh, George Leadership Fellows, joint degree students here at the Kennedy School of Graduates, except for Jake. Two of the three are graduates, 2010. <laughs> and uh, Jake's on his way uh, uh, of the Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School. I'm a great believer in this degree. I've been trying to get more people to take to be, you know, to come and take the joint degree because I think the one thing that's sure that in the future, if you're going to be an effective leader in an organization, you're going to have to be skill, skillful at operating across sectors between government, business, and nonprofit uh, and the various sectors of, of, of society and of industry and, and uh, of education. The reason I say that is because the kinds of problems you're trying to solve in the world today, like some of the ones I just mentioned, or healthcare problems, cannot be solved by any single discipline. It's not just up to the genius in the lab that's going to invite invent a solution. Maybe they will for some of our incurable diseases, but even that's more likely to be a team. But I think we're going to see when you address a problem like AIDS, you're going to have to have a cross-sectoral solution. And that's why Bill Gates' commitment to doing this is so significant that he would make such a massive commitment and, frankly, try to recruit a lot of these uh, young, very wealthy people to do something with their mother money other than creating mansions. So as I said, we have three great panelists, John, uh, John Coleman, uh, who I've known well over the years, comes from Georgia. Is now back in Georgia as a consultant McKinsey, working on some very interesting things I'll let him tell you about at, uh, at McKinsey. Uh, it was our class day speaker at Harvard Business School, which for those of you who aren't familiar with, is a very sought after position. And uh, was a Sarkman fellow and a, and a, uh, a George fellow, and uh, completed his degrees in 2010. And 
and I'll let him tell you a little more about what he's doing since that time and how he's uh, trying to do this and how he has time to write a book because I never could find that time. So I want it does help to have other people contributing to your book. And one of those contributors <laughs> is the woman on his left, Katie Laidlaw, who's also a Georgia Leadership Fellow, now working with the Boston Selling Group down in New York. Tells me she's engaged to be married, which is probably the most exciting news. And, uh, and a, a truly wonderful human being, also a Zuckerman Leadership Fellow. And uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll turn and have her tell you her stories about the time and after. Jay Cusack quite by coincidence, comes from my hometown in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> we finally connected on that just today. But it has provided uh, amazing service on its two tours in Iraq, and it's now going back to Afghanistan and Iraq, trying to really make a difference in those war-torn societies. And so someone has to leave something behind. As I had dinner with Admiral Mike Mullen, the just recently retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's a wonderful human being very, very concerned about what's going to happen in these societies after we leave, and also what's going to happen to all the people that are coming back. And I don't mean the people who are coming to, to Harvard coming back. I'm talking about the hundreds of thousands of people that if they, many of them have serious physical wounds, but many of the ones have wounds you can't see that are, are quite severe and maybe not even they're aware of them and addressed and how we're going to deal with that and get them back into civilian life and how difficult. So, uh, and John, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to ask you to uh, just give you a, a softball here. Now, why did you do this book? What was your underlying intention? Not that you just wanted to make a lot of money selling books, because I know <laughs> you know, you'll make a lot of money selling books. So, you so know, why would you do this when McKinsey already got you working 80 hours a week? Bill knows how lucrative the book business is right now, I think. Um, this really started in, uh, I started business school, and the Kennedy School in 2007 for my dual degree, and obviously that was a pretty important time. Everything was just kind of starting to unravel at that time. I think the housing crisis was yet to happen. Uh, the collapse of Lehman and Bear Stearns happened while I was in business school in my first year. And so the whole world just started kind of coming apart, it felt like, in that first year. We'd obviously been through that before when we were in college. I think Enron and Tyco happened at that time. Uh, September 11th happened during that time for most of us. And so it really felt like my two educational experiences had been at these strange times in history. You know, the first where uh, we talked about the first part in the early 2000s when things started to come apart. Uh, and then secondly, in 2007, when everything started to unravel, and of course we're still feeling that now. And the news was just horrible at the time. I remember thinking, you know, is anything gonna go right while I'm in school right now? Um, and it was, it was a, a complete dissonance from what I was seeing around me because we were hearing all these horror stories about people who had done the wrong thing, about people who were doing the wrong thing, and how that caused the crisis that we were experiencing. But probably like a lot of you, uh, I looked around at my classmates, and I just loved their stories. I loved hearing from them. I loved seeing what they were working on. Because there were a lot of inspirational people around. It was one of those things where you wake up every day and say, how in the world am I even here, right? Um, and so I was thinking, why aren't people telling these stories, right? Because almost immediately when things started to unravel, we started thinking, what is it going to take to get out of this? We certainly can't live with the world the way it was in 2007, 2008, 2009, forever. And so how do we begin to think about taking leadership uh, and responsibility for this crisis and trying to move us past that? And so that was really the impetus um, for the book amongst my, my co-authors and I. And we started thinking we wanted to do two things. One was we just wanted to tell some of the more inspirational stories around us. We'll get to those inspirational stories in a minute. Uh, and two was we really wanted to outline what we thought were some of the trends shaping the future of leadership, especially business leadership, in this context, and what those were, and explain to the world what we saw happening over the next 20 or 30 years that was different in our generation from past generations. And so I think at heart this was supposed to be something of a, an informative and an inspirational work. Uh, we really wanted to gather up a lot of stories about people who are going to hopefully, we think, lead us past this crisis and, and try and create something better for the Great, thank you. Katie, uh, you, you've written a wonderful chapter for the book, and uh, you also spent uh, time in Africa uh, in the past. I'm particularly interested in why you did that, but what you took away from that, and how that's informing your thinking about your current work and what you may want to do in the future. How does that inform you, that kind of experience, assuming that's not where you're going to make your life? Sure. So, I probably hadn't anticipated that I would end up spending a summer in Tanzania. It was, I am love traveling, but I've never done the where you stop traveling and actually stay somewhere and do some work. 
And that was a big shift that summer. You know, the previous summer, in my first summer of an MBA, I was with American Express. It was a fantastic graduate school summer internship. It didn't have much risk to it. And when my second summer came up, I was like, I knew this was possibly one of the last summer experiences for an internship that you could do. And you can either take a job that you might actually take after graduation and just set yourself up on that pipeline, or you might take something where you're not sure if that would be what you would do after graduation for it. And that's what I decided to do. And so with, uh, you know, funding from Harvard Business School that they offer for uh, social enterprise summers. You get about $6,000 is what I had, which doesn't sound like much, but actually got me through the whole summer. And decided to join TechnoServe. And what I liked there was that I was actually working very independently, which was new. Most of the jobs I'd had up to that point and still today with the Boston Consulting Group are team-based. And so you always know that you have people to ask questions to or ideas to bounce off of. And it was actually quite a different situation for me to be by myself in Tanzania trying to do almost a consulting case, uh, figuring out what could I do if I could write a perfect grant to solve a supply chain issue within the agriculture industry. And so what I found that being by myself was actually a really big, uh, something I learned a lot from. It was like, you know, what all have I learned that I can actually go by myself and be actually effective? What have you learned from all this education that when you get dropped down somewhere, what can you really do? Um, the other thing was just confirm that I really enjoyed what I learned every day was not necessarily what my job was, it was the it was the car trip to the office, or particularly this very long drive out into the rural parts of Tanzania to go interview farmers. It was what I observed and how you understood how the culture worked and how things work day to day in Tanzania. That's what I learned a lot from, that you don't learn from reading a book or, and you don't learn from just sitting in an office. And so from those two experiences, what it's influenced me now is just having more of a self-awareness about how I like to work, what I'd like to do during the day, and how I'd like to approach my work, as well as just a reality saying, you know, you, things don't happen in a vacuum anymore. It's just not how things work. And so understanding the supply chain of a Tanzanian farmer's goods landing from his farm to the market in Dar es Salaam can be applied to the work I'm doing right now as a major beverage company, even though I'm working in a totally different part of the company. And so seeing that interconnectedness firsthand is something that has definitely carried forward and even the following summer after graduation, I joined the same NGO TechnoServe and did work in Nigeria. And so just having that continuity um, set, me self, set myself up to not feel like it was a risk. It was actually a part of a compliment to how I hope my career goes forward. You know, it's, it's interesting, those uh, same consumer CEOs I talked to, many were talking about a new vision for agriculture, <laughs> and particularly in the African subcontinent and what can be done there. So uh, <coughs> I, I particularly, I want to probe a little bit deeper before we go to Jake. And just tell us a little bit about, uh, it seems like you're really a more or less a wilderness journey. You know, you were pretty much alone there. It must have been scary, lonely, other things at times. Would you have any of those feelings? Or was it just, as you described, you got a job to do, you got to do the job? So I feel like it, there were definitely places I slept in at night that I would never tell my mom. <laughs> <laughs> we would come into a village, literally into a village. Uh, it's just hard to describe, but it would be, you know, one of those little locks that has the little thing that goes like that. Um, that was the security on the door. And, you know, I was accompanied with uh, the NGO, had a driver to make sure that we were safe, and he was my touch point. But, um, you know, sometimes in some of the larger places, not large is by a very small scale, uh, there would be a Peace Corps person who usually stood out, so you could find them, and uh, ask them questions about their experience and actually get a lot of information from them. So that was a big risk, is just how did I feel, like, did I feel safe? I think the other thing was just, was I gonna get the information I really needed? And so that was what pushed me to start asking more questions from people that were maybe less uh, obvious. So, you know, spending time, oftentimes in the NGO culture, if anyone spent any time in that part of the world, um, people, it's a lot of uh, in and out. People are there to answer a question, they get back in their car, and they go back to wherever they're staying. And I tried to make an effort where I could to spend, if I was spending a couple of days there, to really spend the whole time there. So not only what I was asked to do, so not just talking with farmers, but spending time in the village and asking questions, usually translated or directly with uh, like the local shop person. You'd be amazed at how much person that knows about agriculture seed prices. Or was uh, irrigation gonna be an option? Was that really, what was the block there? Was it because people don't have the materials or is it because it doesn't rain enough during when they're planting the tomato crop? You know, that kind of information I couldn't actually get from books because it's not tracked, and uh, it was best to get it from people that do it every day. Mm -hmm. But just an observation, uh, also that uh, you know the fact that you're willing to go out there. You know, we worked. 
I have a great believer in working in teams, project teams, if you're going in places and doing in large teams, doing this kind of work and learning how to work collaboratively. But there's also something to be gained from really living with yourself and really getting to know yourself at, at a much deeper level and gaining that level of self-awareness. There's one thing I hear from heads of major organizations. I had a number of people pull me aside and say, can I just talk to you for 15 minutes? Here I'm running this huge organization. I've got 100,000 people. I don't have anyone to talk to. I'm really at home. And being with yourself, it may sound, because these are people with people all the time. In fact, they can hardly get away. But the idea of being with, and, and really having that introspective reflective time, surely that kind of experience, as Ray Barkhand, who's a good friend of mine, described similar kinds of experience when he went to, uh, went to Kenya as a junior at North Carolina. So Jake, let me come to you. Uh, I'm particularly interested in what you're thinking about. How does your uh, great service to the nation in Iraq and two tours there in, Af in Afghanistan and Iraq and Afghanistan, in that theaters, how does that inform what you're thinking about now, about your thinking about your work going forward, and how will that influence you uh, during the course of your life and career? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, th I think it's interesting because when you're doing something altruistic or something that seems like a very good thing to do, like economic development in Afghanistan, People assume that you know you're doing it for the best possible reasons, but I think to be honest, you know, part of the reason that I'm still involved in these countries is to assuage some level of guilt that I have for leaving the military during a time of war while the wars are still ongoing. Um, another part of it is that it's well suited to my skill set, and it's a the kind of environment that I like, and I still sort of like that element of adventure that comes with working in these places. And so, for me, making that transition from the military to working on uh, the private sector economic development side, I think interesting point was that there's no particular mythology about these places. Um, you tend to think that sort of the, the rules all have to change when you're in Iraq or Afghanistan or another place. But really, and Katie was talking about this a little bit, like the same core principles that inform the way that people think about economic incentives in the U.S. or developed market or in Africa are the same in the Congo still. And I think if you can have that approach and, and understand um, that people are making relatively rational decisions, given the options that are in front of them, it sort of frees you up um, to not be trapped in thinking that these problems are completely intractable and unable to solve. Um, you know, just, just to return, I guess, to the original point of saying, you know, you don't always do this for the best reasons. People tend to give you a free pass if you say that you're doing, you have very good intentions that you're doing something and not hold you as accountable as they might otherwise. Um, you could ask to speak on more panels and write off as if you're doing work in Afghanistan and Iraq than if you're doing private equity buyouts out of New York. Um, <laughs> if, uh, and, and so the danger there is I think there's in a lot of these projects where you have great intentions and you're trying to do the best possible thing, there's this reluctance to acknowledge failure. Whereas in business, you will have to acknowledge failure because you're not profitable. But in these, in these situations, in places like Afghanistan or Africa, where the donor, the implementer, and the beneficiary, none of those people have incentives to acknowledge failure. Because the donor wants your project to look like a success, the implementer wants to keep getting the money, the beneficiary certainly wants to keep getting the money. So what I found in Afghanistan is the projects that got the most money, the most funding, the most attention, were actually the worst projects in the worst districts. So I think it's very important that, you know, while we have this, this great rhetoric around the fact that, um, you know, this transformational power of social enterprise, that we still hold ourselves as accountable as we would if we had an answer to a PL. So I'd like to go back to your, your earlier, your starting comment. You, you served. In the United States Marine Corps for how many years? Uh, about five years. And your final rank was? Captain. Right. You served your country. Yep. You fulfilled your obligation. Uh, it, I'm just shaking my head. Uh, having worked as a civilian Department of Defense with a lot of military <coughs> officers after I got out of Harvard Business School, but I did not serve in any place like Afghanistan or, or Iraq, that's for sure. Uh, why guilt? I'm just help me understand. That's a very honest admission you had. So I, I just want to probe that a little bit. That, uh, why, would, why would you, having served your country, completed your service, you didn't leave early, uh, you know? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think, so part of it is that the job that I did in the military, as it worked out, I was better at that than I was at anything else that I've done in my life. And that includes things that I've done afterwards. Were so, you also more passionate, Jay? I mean, I think you're inevitably more passionate because you sort of, your life is on the line, yeah. other people's lives are on the line, and so that helps. <laughs> into a sense of passion into, uh, into what you're doing. 
Um, and, and, to, and to leave, you know, I left for a number of reasons, um, one of which is I had made my sister rediscover her wedding three times, and I just felt like I really had to be parents were pushing me strongly on that point. And I was frustrated with sort of the, the hierarchy and bureaucracy of the military, and it's ironic that, you know, literally two years after getting out, I went from being a captain to briefing directly to Admiral Mullen. And it's interesting, and uh, this sort of plays in the larger theme of the book, that when you move cross boundary like that, there's opportunities to jump way above where you would have previously interacted with in the spectrum. So by moving away from the military, I now plug back in at a very different level in, in dealing with these problems, which is rewarding for me because it's very frustrating as a relatively low ranking um, person to not have your opinions necessarily um, be listened to or counted. Um, but I don't, like, I don't see that guilt necessarily as a bad thing. I think it's a motivating thing. There's this great line in this movie that I think was unusually formative to me, uh, Saving Private Ryan, which came out when I was in high school. And this whole movie goes by, and you know, the, the point of the movie is that they do all these things to save one guy, Private Ryan. And um, there's sort of the epic conclusion is, you know, they look at Private Ryan and say, and everybody's basically died as a consequence of this. And they say, earn this. You have to earn this. And for me, I think when I think about either my fellow uh, Marines who have been killed or have come back wounded, um, you know, there's a sense that I have to earn the fact continually for the rest, uh, the rest of my life, you know, that I was blessed with all these opportunities. And to get to your point, like most people leaving the military do not get to come to Harvard to speak on panels and get congratulated continually for their accomplishments. You know, they go back to low paying jobs and McDonald's and struggle day to day. So if they get jobs, right? So, you know, for me, there's a sense that I've really been given this gift, and that I, but and I, but I don't think that is. I mean, guilt is maybe the wrong word for it because it does sort of imbue a sense of passion. You have a very strong super ego, which shows a very high sense of responsibility and conscience. <coughs> picked up on that, so I, it's not at all a bad thing. I think it, it reflects that. John, let me come back to you because you had a chance to uh, choose from many, many people to choose from to ask for stories, and you cut across <laughs> all the sectors. Um, and I remember when I was coming out of school, it's like. Never the Twain show meet. I mean, like business people, the last thing you wanted to do was go to Washington. Uh, working with nonprofits was something they only did when under duress to serve the chairman of the board in any way and raise a little money or uh, you know or give a little money to their corporate foundations to let their uh, their to kind of assuage their conscience, you know, uh, their guilt, uh, so they could continue doing what they really love to do, which was selling soda water, you know, and uh, so but. But you commented to me about the interaction between the sectors. How do you see that evolving as we look ahead? I made some early my, my thoughts. What are your thoughts on how do you see the interaction between the various sectors emerging? Because uh, you've been on a joint degree program. You've had experience in all three sectors. Mm -hmm. So I think I see that overlap in a couple of different ways. We actually, as part of the book, did a survey of around 510 uh, MBA students from top schools who graduated recently or were in school. Um, and one of the findings from that survey, at least, was when we asked the question, do you see increasing overlap between the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, around 85% of people said yes. And then when you ask the follow-up question, do you think business leaders really need to understand those two sectors to be successful, again, around 85% of people from around eight or nine different schools uh, said yes. And so I think that our generation increasingly, and we take it for granted here, I think honestly in this community at Kennedy, at HBS, at other schools, because we're surrounded by it constantly. But our generation really sees not only how those things are coming together in the external environment, so the forces that are bringing those sectors closer together, but also a path-based way by which we can navigate careers across those sectors in a way that I think was difficult before. Um, so in the first half of that, I do think the external environment is really bringing those three together. And I think that the crises we've faced over the past decade are a pretty good indication of that. Um, you look, for instance, at, um, at big GSEs or other organizations that were already a collaboration of that. And when that collaboration doesn't work properly, like it hasn't in the housing market right now, there are disastrous consequences for that, right? However, uh, those interactions are more frequent. We're not rolling that back. Regulatory agencies are playing an increasing role in finance. Uh, consumer goods companies have to operate in hundreds of international contexts when you talk about some of the, the companies you were speaking to. And not all of those countries are quite as hands off with the businesses that operate within their borders. And so they're having to learn how to operate with the public sector or the nonprofit sector within those areas. And so I think that businesses 
are really seeing the need uh, to learn from those other sectors and to collaborate with them. Meanwhile, I think that individuals like Katie and Jake and other folks are really seeing that not only are their skills improved by finding uh, out how to operate in those different contexts, but it's now possible for them to operate in those different contexts in a way that wasn't possible or wasn't as possible 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Um, the gentleman you mentioned, Rai Barkat, who has a great book out also that I'll plug, it happened on the way to war. Um, Rai worked in all three sectors. So he founded a nonprofit called Carolina for Kibera in Kenya. He worked in the Marine Corps, uh, like Jay, and now he's working in an energy company. He was a dual degree here. And he has a great essay at the beginning of the book, and there's a reason the convergence set, uh, chapter that we're talking about now is the first chapter in the book. He has a great essay about the different skills that he learned in those sectors that are incredibly important to the other sectors he's worked in. So as a, for instance, his experience in the military and in the nonprofit sphere really taught him to bring to business a prioritization of values and mission, and how important mission is to a private enterprise, just as it would be to a public enterprise. He said it brought him a lot more organizational understanding, so how to work in complex organizational environments, which for a Kennedy School student is probably second nature. For a business school student, sometimes the default is to relapse into just analysis and those sorts of things without taking those dynamics into play. And so I think those skills are incredibly important as these organizations get more and more complex. And I think that businesses, as they're waking up to that environment, and other nonprofits and governmental organizations are suddenly seeing that folks like Katie or Jake or Rai, who can operate all of those different contexts, are incredibly important to the success of their organization. So I think they're coming together in just a lot of different ways. One of the characteristics I see, saw in my generation and the generation kind of been growing up was a, a, a tendency to surround yourself with hierarchy and to manage through people in quite formal processes and a failure to truly engage what was happening, as you might call it, on the ground, in the marketplace, at the first level, with people who are doing the work. If you're running a, a major pharmaceutical company, not being in the lab telling the scientists about their innovation passion and not being out uh, as the three of you are. Uh, and I think one of the things that's just an observation that's really changing in leaders today's leaders, the, the CEOs uh, who've been appointed in the last several years, are truly engaged at the first level of the business. You know, they're walking store floors at Target. It may sound mundane to you, but uh, they're very much engaged in what's happening on the ground. They spend all their time out there. Okay, so and the global company puts enormous pressure on people, but they're not in any way kind of sitting back in their office. If you look at the failed organization, in all three sectors, largely the organizations where the leaders fail to engage with the people doing the work, and instead surrounding themselves with layers of people to work through, and it took them away from uh, what was really going on, and they lacked a keen sense of what was happening. And I think that, I wonder if that, do you all think that will change in your generation, or do you think your default will get me more of moving away from that, that and uh, managing through other people? through other people. Um, I, I think for, um, you know, it's interesting. I think so the, the characteristic of, of this generation is, is much more adaptation, I think. So people switch jobs more rapidly now because people hold more jobs. Mm -hmm. There's less of a sort of sense that you're wedded to a particular hierarchy. Um, I think that can be a very good thing. Um, but it also means that you don't necessarily form bonds with people that you work with in quite the same way. The way that you form bonds in a tech company in Silicon Valley is different than the way um, that you would have formed them, um, I think, 40 years ago, because now the expectation is that you're looking for the next hot startup to, to go off to. Um, and I think the, uh, the opportunities in terms of, of, of going cross sector and what that opens up in terms of leadership is, I think, Probably 95% of the time when I get credit for doing something smart, it's usually because I just took somebody else's best practice from an unconnected domain and just brought it over. And because it, you didn't have that in that domain before, um, people think it's revolutionary. But in reality, you're just taking something that's common sense in the private sector and applying it to something in the public sector. Or you're taking something from intelligence techniques in the government and you're applying it to an investment methodology mm -hmm. in, a, in a frontier market. Um, so I think that sort of flexibility and adaptation is a, is a strength for leadership, but it also means that people don't have as much trust and loyalty in the bonds that uh, traditionally have sort of put all the organizations together. So do you think that's a good thing? Uh, 
you know, it's, it's, it's an adaptation to the way that the world is, so I, so I guess it's a good thing. I mean, it's the reality that we're, that we're faced with today. Um, I think the, the question is, in the absence of, um, in the absence of those common bonds, what holds people together politically and things like that? So there's sort of this larger framework that you can see um, in the U.S. right now where the problem is not us at Harvard Business School or Harvard Kennedy School convincing each other of what the right solution is for the problem or that we need to do something about global warming. The problem is convincing the Midwestern religious fundamentalist who's coming at this from a fundamentally different viewpoint or the autocrat in uh, a third world dictatorship um, that's sort of jaded by lectures from the West. So. <coughs> People, in the absence of sort of these hierarchies and the sense of place, fall back on, um, I think, more deeper primal religious ethnic bonds in a, set, in a place of uncertainty. And it can be difficult for, I think, people in these rooms to be able to transcend that. So does that, that then, I would infer from what you said then that they also tend to stay within their comfort zone. They tend to surround themselves with more people like them. Exactly. Which seems ironic in a world that's increasingly diverse. Or at least certainly speaking for myself, my greatest learning to come from people who have had totally different backgrounds and totally different experiences and who come from totally different uh, situations. But, you know, just going back to the Facebook offering today, the so-called Facebook generation, but, uh, you know, one of the questions I would ask is, you know, would you, if you have a life-threatening situation or very, very important news or you're facing a terrible dilemma, would you really share it? in front of 7,500 people on Twitter or a couple thousand on Facebook. And where do you find that sense of intimacy in your life and that sense of people to whom you turn? And uh, so, do you have any thoughts on that, Katie? Well, I think to that point, something that this generation is increasingly acknowledging is just the value and the potential opportunity provided by <coughs> So having a mentor that is someone that you look up to and having a mentor is someone that you just actually know you'll plan to work with that person and that's why the advice is great because it's always fresh and raw and maybe more honest to you. Um, I think that's something that this generation is embracing more and it re does require actually a lot of trust in a different way. So whereas I do agree, like you may not have as much trust with who you're working with in the office, you may actually build more trust with someone of a different generation or maybe even a different industry who your age who can be that person to either challenge you or raised the issue of trust, uh, the latest uh, Harvard Kennedy School, the annual report of looking at confidence in our leaders really reads very directly on this issue of trust and the loss of trust in our society. Uh, and I personally think it will have devastating consequences for any kind of organizations and for the kind of issues you're raising, about the ability to people bond together to get things done. If you really believe it takes people to work from diverse backgrounds, to make effective changes around really complex and tractable problems, uh, this loss of trust is uh, it is really uh, palpable and a deep, deep concern, at least to me. Uh, if you all agree with that, how do we regain that trust? Yeah. Maybe you don't think we should. Maybe we should just all operate as independent beings. But uh, <laughs> if you do agree with it, how do we regain that trust? Now, I think this is a really tough question, the question of trust in the modern world. And to cut political leaders some slack for just a moment because we might even have some political leaders here today. Um, I think this is a really, really hard environment to be a political leader in right now because you're meeting kind of two conflicting expectations. One is the old expectation uh, that you can meet everyone's needs, that you can answer affirmatively to everyone, that it can always be good news, especially in economies that have grown, in societies that have become Not freer. tell the truth. Uh, that, that you can bend the truth in order to make everyone like you a little bit, uh, and in order to show everyone you're on their side, right? At the same time, the rise of all these communication technologies make it functionally impossible to do that because all these views are competing. Everyone has flaws. Everyone has personal characteristics they're not proud of. Everyone has experiences they're not proud of. And so we're at this point in history where we still have all the expectations that our leaders can be perfect and they can agree with us in every single way. And we have all the technology to prove that that's completely impossible. Um, and our leaders are really struggling with how to manage that. Now, I think they have their own foibles and failings as well, but I think the external environment is only compounding uh, the fact that it's a very, very hard uh, profession to be in right now. And I'm actually, I'm pessimistic about some things. One thing I'm optimistic about is we are gradually adapting to that environment. So we now know, we're almost at peak distrust, um, to coin a phrase, 
and that we, we're getting comfortable with the fact now that we're going to find out more about our political leaders than we did before. We're getting comfortable, hopefully, with the fact that we can't agree with them all the time. And they're going to disagree with us, and we're going to have to support the person who aligns with us the most, even if that person dis disagrees with us and delivers difficult messages. And I think that the responsibility for kind of cultivating that culture is on us. Because if we can start to communicate that to our leaders, then hopefully the kinds of people who are trustworthy, who are authentic, to, to talk about a, a, something that Professor George talks about quite a lot, uh, can feel safe getting into that environment and taking leadership positions um, and knowing that people, people will support them even if they can't maintain that facade of perfection that I think we still expect. So do you think with your generation that this idea of spinning things is uh, going to work? I'm hoping it won't What you're saying is uh, just kind of shading the truth or moving it your way or giving well, I hope a slightly do distorted <laughs> view of things that I is favorable to yourself. That. I'm hoping we, we take the, uh, uh, call it the, let's call it the, for lack of a better term, whether you agree with them or not, the Al Franken realm, which is, Everybody knows what you've done in your past. Everybody sees everything you've ever done, all the bad sketches or things they disagree with or whatever. And what they're starting to pay attention is to what you're saying now and what you believe now and, and where you're going now. And I think that that combination of authenticity of being able to own up to your past mistakes and those sorts of things but still take positions of leadership and also being able to tell the truth because at some point over the next four or five years, political leaders, at least in this country, are going to have to deliver tough messages. We can't go on with the way we've got it. And, and if people become accepting of that, potentially we'll have a more authentic and a more trustworthy environment where people don't have to bend the truth, where they can say what it is, and, and the electorate is comfortable with that. I've already said I don't claim any pretense to being effective in the political realm, but I will say that in the business sector, it will not work today. I'll just make a flat out statement. If you try to spin your employees, right. you'll lose them. Right. They're too, way too smart and too cynical, if I might add, too distrusting. You try to spin them about how great things are. When everyone knows it's not great, the quality of our automobile has never been better when you know that you're working on an assembly line to do some junk. You know, uh, it does not work. Yeah. If you don't call it like it is a leader, you instantly lose credibility, and you may actually you lose trust, but you also may lose key people. You know, the, the good people go away and the bad people stay. Well, let me, uh, let me open it up to those in the audience for your questions. Uh, if you'd like to anyone, just give us your name and uh, what you know and to whom you'd like to address the question. Yes. Um, I'm Anya Malkov, and I look to all of you. I, it's an easy question and incredibly practical. Um, as your students recently told you that, what class, uh, which class of the Kennedy School and our business school have you found the most impactful? Yeah, so I think for me, it was, like, it was, it's interesting, there's always just a couple of key classes. My first year here, um, I was in Rory Stewart's class, which is a center on Afghanistan, so just kind of one of these sort of guest lecturers who's here for just a bit, and, and kind of character, and somebody that I really identified, he had spent some time in Afghanistan and Iraq, and was very helpful too when I was thinking about my summer sort of career plans, I sort of laid out what I, what I thought. It was a you know, reasonably unconventional option of like working for an NGO um, in Afghanistan or Iraq, and he sort of encouraged me to go even more farther road than that, so I ended up raising my, my own funding essentially and traveling alone in Afghanistan, interviewing entrepreneurs. So if you, there's some particular professor that you find that their writings or anything else that you identify with, I'd really encourage you to seek them out and use them as a mentor, even if you don't agree with a lot of the things that they say, because that can be very powerful in helping you clarify your own vision. And then interestingly for me, because I had so little experience, that just that first core year of the business school was immensely helpful in, um, in, in, in what I did in the next summer, which is doing investments across the Middle East. Um, and also, you know, the, the real value and this is another thing I encourage you to do, being here, is that people will talk to you. Like, you can send an email to almost anybody, and they will agree to talk to you. And they don't think that, and especially if you send in your first year, and you make it clear that you're not looking for a job, they'll be very happy to talk to you. <laughs> um, which you don't have before or after this. You're no longer as innocent. There's always, they're always thinking, what's your agenda? What's your business angle on this? Um, so I think it's really powerful to just say, this is the area that I'm interested in, and I want to write a report on it or whatever. And, uh, and go out and find those, those subject matter experts and talk to them. And then it's amazing, you publish like 
one couple pieces in, in wherever they show up, and all of a sudden you become the expert on a particular topic. I mean, that's sort of the magic of new social media and things like that. Um, so it really can be a great opportunity for you to fill deep expertise in the area relatively rapidly. Right. Who else has a question? Yes. Um, Bill, you, you mentioned that there's a profound change in how hierarchies are being organized in the private sector. And it's very difficult for them to get to grips with that. Now, you know, Jake mentioned how, how, how much worse it is in the public sector and in the non-profit sector, and as much as it's a very, it's very sort of, you know, profound unwillingness to hold yourself accountable in any meaningful sense, and you know, Jake, you know, drove you out of the military. Um, do, you see, do any of you see the public sector and the non-profit sector responding to these changes that you speak of in hierarchies, where a youngster like you know, Jake is not driven out of the military because you know, he's so frustrated that no one will hear his views? I mean, actually, Claw, I, I do know Ed Brandler, so. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so it was interesting when, when, when Bill and John were talking about social media, there's another point to that, which is not just it's more difficult to sort of spin the message. The other point is that you get feedback much more rapidly on your ideas. So in the past, you might have a particular vision, and you might be encouraged to pursue it and, and not be able to ignore that feedback. But now, as soon as you put that idea online, there'll be a blog post about it, there'll be a Twitter post about it, telling from many people telling you exactly how bad your idea is. Um, and so it, that can be a very good mechanism, and I think it's happened in the public sector that you can even see in the Middle East how social media has been a vehicle for increased transparency and accountability for those governments. But it can also sort of destroy the vision factor, which is now I'm intimately aware of what people think of everything that I write or everything that I try and do because I'm posting it on Facebook or talking about it on Twitter, and you lose sort of that larger um, piece of just having a vision and pursuing it. I mean, even for me, it's interesting to see how I change my arguments about what I'm doing, whether I'm Harvard Kennedy School or the business school, how I change the way I justify myself to my friends about the kind of jobs that I want to do or the kind of things I want to do. I, but I think people, I was just going to say, I think people vastly overestimate the differences in bureaucracy between large corporations and public sector entities. I actually think that there are bureaucratic problems in the public sector, but there are also a remarkable number of positions that are potentially even more meritocratic or, or easier for people to rise at very young ages uh, than they are in the private sector. So if you look, I think uh, Barack Obama's lead speechwriter is still what, he's like 28 right now or something like that. Uh, our president is younger than I would guess the majority of Fortune 500 CEOs by 12 or 13 years. Um, I have friends who work in the state of Georgia who manage obviously a huge state budget and those sorts of things who are in their late 20s and serving as like deputy chief of staff to a governor or something like that. So I think that the public sector actually has a pretty different elements of it struggle with this bureaucracy uh, for sure, but it's, it's also remarkable to me um, how unbureaucratic some of those positions are and how meritocratic they are. Um, and so I think it's, it's more about finding those places that will let you innovate and it will let you be an entrepreneur within either of those sectors, whether it be a giant corporation or a public sector in it, um, and really trying to make your mark there, because I think they exist, at least in my experience, in both places. Thank I you. would also say just even, um, so I'm with the Boston Consulting Group, there is a structure of how long you spend in certain roles. Typically, you can try to massage things, but there is kind of a plan. And I found that when I got there, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to spend my time on, because it's also what you need to spend time on, but you want to make part of your day to be something you want to be spending time on. And uh, I am still really interested in agriculture and business. And so there is no defined practice there in that. I basically tried to figure out who was it I needed to talk to and then basically pitch that idea to that person. I find that even in the nonprofit sector, public sector, any of these places, if you find out what matters to you and then you can make it sound like a possible argument why someone else should care, that's always a way to maybe find yourself a little out of where you might have to be based on time scale. Yeah. Time for one more question. Yes, sir. So um, I was extremely moved. Did everyone hear him back there? Yeah. 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 So I was uh, extremely moved by the book and the value and importance of listening to you guys, of pursuing uh, passion and purpose. But we, like right here in a place of like, privilege, I guess I would describe that. Do you guys think that for people outside of like a privileged environment like this, it's possible for other people of our generation and society to be able to pursue that passion and purpose? It's a, I mean, that's a great, great question. Um, I think obviously 
you know, the book was written by a fair number of people who are in pretty privileged positions, and even the survey went out to MBA, right? So we've got a small subsegment of a large population, and probably one of the most privileged subsegments of that population. Um, I think I think that it's proper to say yes, it's possible, while acknowledging that in many cases it's much more difficult, right? I still believe that in most of the societies that we live in, there are opportunities to advance, uh, to make something of yourself, to follow your passions, to follow your purpose. Uh, but that's not to say it'll be easy, that's not to say it will be just like this, and of course that's not to say you have to go to a place like this to make that happen. I think what's inspiring to me, I just read a book called The World Changers, which is about the 25, uh, what, what this gentleman selected is the 25 biggest world changing entrepreneurs alive today. And what was shocking was how few of those people went to elite institutions, how few of them had academic pedigrees, and how many of them uh, started with relatively little. I didn't realize, for instance, Richard Branson was selling CDs out of the trunk of his car uh, when he started Virgin, Virgin Music. Um, so I think the message always has to be that you know there is that possibility, and our responsibility as, as leaders is to keep society structured in a way that it's possible for anyone to find a passion or a purpose in it and to move through that society, and that's a constant struggle. Um, and one that's not perfect right now that we have to keep fighting for. Um, but we also have to be cognizant of the barriers that remain. And I think that for those of us who, who do have privileged positions or in positions of leadership, I think it's a real responsibility for us to help knock down those barriers wherever we find them. Um, because, because everyone should have access to those sorts of things. David Gergen had a question or a final <coughs> comment to that. Well, I wanted to follow up on one aspect of that because it's, uh, uh, Mike and I are, are visiting with Bob Putnam this afternoon. We've worked on a lot of work on social capital. And I've had this conversation with him recently about, back to Chair Hudson, um, <clears throat> about uh, my hopes, your hopes, Bill, for this next generation. And Putnam argues from his research that a lot of this sort of social idealism is really located in the upper middle classes. And that there's a lot of civic disengagement going on in your generation and people who are of uh, lesser income and that sort of thing, which is very consistent with what Charles Murray has just published a book about, and that is that the upper income people in this country are becoming much more uh, the, the upholders of values of marriage, of community, of uh, uh, civic engagement, uh, whereas we're seeing that sort of collapse uh, in uh, the lower income families, where a family has become much, much less important, communities become much less important and people are pulling back. That has a lot to do with social mobility and the other issues. But I, I'm going to ask the question, how can people <coughs> like you all, coming from, you know, coming to this elite university, how do we open up those opportunities? How do we get the civic engagement? How do we enroll people to be going to Teach for America who are, you know, coming from a lower income, might be minority, uh, but our, I just have a very different agenda. Like, how do we get make this? Uh, the Second World War generation was a great generation because it involved everybody. It was inclusive, it, and it gave people a sense of solidarity. They went across class lines, and now, increasingly, as we move toward class lines, how do we? How, how do we, at an institution like this? How do we have people coming out who really sort of figure out how do we change this? I think it's very. It's a complementary point to your your question, and I'm I'm starting to wrestle with it myself. I'm really curious about your views on. <laughs> We're going to have to wrap things up here because it's 1 o'clock, but any final comments from each of the three of you? I would just say the one thing is just the real value of getting experiences outside of any of the conventional pathways that we're traditionally accustomed to because there's a certain sort of, whether it's bank or consulting, there's pathways that lead us to these places and there's pathways that lead out. And even the more unconventional ones, like the ones captured in this book with NGOs, can still be very sort of um, insular and still dealing with people very much like everyone else. And I found for me the biggest value of being in the Marine Corps was the challenge of leading people who came from vastly different backgrounds and had vastly different motivation um, than the people in these sort of rooms. You can make easy arguments um, at Harvard to people based on money and reason, and those arguments don't always play everywhere else in the world. So the farther you can get away from that box, I think you can get closer to answering the question of um, you know, how do we really engage the rest of society as opposed to just the so-called elite. Okay. Katie, final comment? Sure. I think a lot of it has to do with just it is community engagement. I think that's really the, it is a worry. I think it's something that I'm not sure. Um, I moved from Boston to New York and just even the shift of how people interact. Like if New York is a huge city, every version of everything is there and they all ride the subway and they all, but not everyone rides the subway. And how do we tackle this issue? Um, I think 
actually from an event earlier this year that David Gurton was at, he spoke about how you can have your job and then you can have a career, and then sometimes later on you can get to the part where you're doing a lot more things and you can continue the engagement. But actually the real challenge is how do you integrate those two things together? And I think that that's a luxury we have from this school, that you can think about this integration, that not everyone has. But I think then the onus falls on us to figure out, fine, how can I integrate these now, and how can I involve myself in the community in a way that I feel like uh, you're tackling those issues instead of talking about them, you're actually talking with people to try to solve it. So David's question is fantastic. I wish we had more time to talk about this. I think the first thing that came to mind for me, just to be very tactical, is I think education is probably the most important issue in the country right now in a lot of ways. Because if, if those differences persist uh, until someone's 18 or 19 years old, I think it becomes much more intractable. I think it's harder to roll back those differences uh, for a 20 or a 30 year old than it is for a five year old or a six year old. Um, and I know my wife just graduated from the ed school here and she's working education access right now. Um, and what's remarkable to me is, you know, we get eight, 10 hours a day with every student in the country in some educational institution in this country. Um, and we fail to eliminate those differences that you're talking about. So I think that that time we have with those students uh, for the first 15 years of their life or so, uh, is just remarkably important to solving that problem. There are a lot of other things that you have to do to do it, but I think that that's probably one of the biggest places we're falling down right now in, in trying to eliminate those differences. And I think the education system previously was probably a big reason the society was a bit more, um, a, a bit more integrated in that way. So that's a huge, huge issue. I think. Thank you. We could probably spend several hours on that one, David, and uh, because that's such an important topic, and we may not get the answers. I will say that when we are here and we read the New York Times and other publications in the Wall Street Journal, we tend to gain quite an American-centric perspective on things. And when you're with people. And we have a fascination now with China, but when you're in other places, the perspective, like in Germany, for example, is very, very different on these same questions. And the societal uh, bonding is quite different to what we're seeing. So uh, I think we're going through rapid change, and the question is, what can we do to help that move in the right direction and overcome some of the uh, deep problems we've seen in my generation? Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, John.